Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, President Obama's big health care summit is happening this week. Uh, Stuart Shapiro is here to analyze. Then two of the state's leading journalists are in the house. Joe the Plumber, what's that all about? That and more following these words. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Hi, welcome back to the program. We'll, get, well, we're going to get right to it. Dr. Stuart Shapiro is here. He's the president and CEO of the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association. He's one of the, uh, you, you know, one, one of the guys we always turn to when we have questions about health care. He's one of the state's leading experts. All right, doctor, let's get to it. President Obama, they put you in that room, and I know you've written about this. They put you in that room this week. What are you going to say? I'm going to look at both the Democrats and the Republicans, and if I'm, the TV cameras aren't running. Mm -hmm. I'd say, if you guys really want a settlement, there's a, there's a way to do that. If the president wants real bi bipartisanship, and the Republicans want that, it's easy to get this mm -hmm. done. Lyndon Johnson could have. And that's the way that President Obama should act. He ought to say, Good look, guys, we agree there ought to be insurance reform. There ought to be purchasing across state lines and eliminating, excluding people with pre-existing conditions. And by the way, the American people favor that. Absolutely. So they're right on board there. He'd say, let's go for universal health care as a goal, but let's start small Correct. and progress. Take three, four million people this year, yeah. and let's see how the economy goes. And I, then he'd say... You now, hold on. Give me the... You, you have the idea. A little bit of Medicaid expansion, maybe Medicare, S-chip. Go ahead. Right. I mean, You'd expand Medicaid to a, to a population. You might take some small business and, and put them in there also and provide some subsidies. But that's the easy piece. Then you take the next piece. You say, we're going to bend the cost curve. We're going to say we're going to pay for approved services, mm -hmm. approved meaning that they know that they will benefit the patient, right. not just spend money to generate more procedures. We don't need all the CAT scans we're doing. We don't need all the MRIs. We don't need all the x-rays. And we don't need all the surgery. Then I'd take a fourth piece. I'd say that drugs, we're going to use generics much more, and mm -hmm. we're going to import drugs. Again, something they can by and right. large agree with. Right. Fifth, I'd say that we have to eliminate fraud and abuse. And then I'd say, finally, let's do some tort reform. So the tort reform brings the Republicans. Yep. The insurance reform brings them all together. Yep. You set universal goals, and Why, you've got well, the framework. I've got to interrupt you here. This sounds so sensible. How did it all come unglued? I mean, the, Obama is committed overreach, to... Overreach, you think, a little? He overreached. He's committed to the trial lawyers that there won't be tort reform. Yeah. Meaningful work. The Republicans think that they will benefit yeah. by keeping saying no. And the Democrats really think that rather than compromise, mm -hmm. they're better off by not passing anything yeah. and blaming it on the Republicans. It's a heck of a way to run a country. Yeah. It doesn't work, and it doesn't play to what the yeah. American people want. And, and in these, in just the points that you have made over and over again in poll after poll, the American, the American people favor covering the 30 million or so that, you know, has been in, in the discussions. Absolutely. They favor that. In addition to that, most Americans like their health care, right? They're happy with it. They're happy with their doctor. People like you, they're happy with you. Why? I, what I can't understand is it seems so, and, and I know I'm simplifying, but on the basic goals that you've just outlined, there's a remarkable consensus among the American people. Absolutely. And the American people, especially the ones that vote, Mm -hmm. including the elderly, don't want a big price tag. They don't want a billion dollars right now, excuse me, a, a trillion dollars right. right now. Yeah. They just don't want to spend yeah. it to cover a whole 35 or 40 million people. Mm -hmm. Start slow. We can build this and we can do this. America great, will great. be happy and it would great. work. Great, great, great analysis. Look, let's go to a break and come back and... Uh, Second segment. Well, I want to go we'll head right into the state budget and let you get into that with Governor Riddell. Great analysis. All right, here we are with Dr. Stuart Shapiro, our guy on health care. We'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania Cyber Charter School, bringing educational innovation and freedom to the children of Pennsylvania. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by PAConstructionJobs.com. 
For more information about rewarding careers in the highway construction industry, visit paconstructionjobs.com. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. All right, welcome back to the program with Dr. Stuart Shapiro. Okay, uh, doctor, let's talk a little bit about the budget. Uh, Go Governor Rendell, incredibly tough budget year, uh, deficits expected. They rated the, 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 these different accounts last year. Uh, uh, g give us a quick overview of the, of the health care piece of the state budget. The, the governor is clearly facing a difficult time, as is the entire state. And I'm glad I didn't have to make up that budget. <laughs> and there isn't a lot to celebrate in that budget, but there is something that we have to give Governor Rendell credit for. And that is he has made sure that the safety net for the elderly to receive care, especially in nursing homes, mm -hmm. isn't frayed anymore. Right. And he's done that in a way that really does depend on the federal government. And as we've talked, they're, inter they're interrelated. If you, Medicaid has consistently been, consistently underpays for care, whether it's in a hospital or a nursing home. The federal government through Medicare supports the Medicaid program. So what they've done is he's proposed a budget that assumes that the federal matching under Medicaid will in fact be renewed and everyone should be writing their senators and their congressmen to say, make sure you extend the federal match. Mm -hmm. And then he also presumes that the Medicare won't be cut as it was proposed in the health care reform bill, right. in which we've just talked about it shouldn't. You, and that you, doesn't look like that will happen. And it doesn't look like that. And, but again, the Obama administration may come back and try to take those cuts, which right. they haven't to date. If those things are in place, the match and no more Medicare cuts, the safety net stays. It's frayed. Mm -hmm. But at least people are going to be able to receive yep. some basic health care services now, now, in nursing homes and at home. All right, that's, um, another perspective is there's some $850 million expected to come to the state, as I understand it, and it's part of that Medicaid funding you're talking about. That also means that would allow the state to offset that amount and put it in other areas of the budget. So there's a kind of, am I correct about that? Yeah. So there's a kind of twofer going on here. The Medicaid funding would be there. It would free up additional state dollars in other areas, or I got that all wrong. No, it, it, it essentially does that. But when you look at the whole pot of state dollars, if that mm -hmm. $850 million is gone, is gone oh, it disaster. Doesn't, it's a disaster. So yeah. it doesn't matter which pot it goes into. Yeah. It's the total amount. And... So that, that's why I say that federal matching is so important that the mm -hmm. federal Congress, the House and the Senate, get that passed and get that quickly. Yeah. Well, there should be, I mean, I mean, look, when you look at overall state budget, you've got education, you've got the, the, the budget for medical assistance, Medicaid, and, and then you have uh, uh, in, increases in, uh, for, for prisons for, right. uh, in the criminal justice area. They're the three big things, right? So... If you get one of those pieces comes unglued, the whole budget gets wrecked. It, the, the whole budget gets wrecked if the federal stimulus funds are not there to support the budget. Yeah. How concerned are you down the road when these stimulus monies go away that with the economy the way it is, that just adds pressure on hospitals and physicians and nursing homes, you know, the folks you represent? We, we've got a plan for that. Yeah. And hopefully the economy is going to recover. It looks like it's going to start to recover a year from now slowly, but it will get there. But right now we are very dependent okay. on those dollars, but we have to plan ahead for when yep. those, th those days uh, without federal dollars will come, and they will come. Okay. All right. Great, great update. There he is, Dr. Stuart Shapiro. I love that, uh, the, the, the ideas you put forward on the federal. I mean, I've given speeches, nobody listens to me, and I've said incremental, do all these you know, expand Medicaid a little bit. You could even take the Medicare age, maybe drop it to 60, put more money in S chip, and then get the cost down. A point you addressed that. They got it. We got to get health care costs can't go up four times inflation, can they? And can, Not forever. <laughs> and right now, they're at 17 percent of our gross domestic product, yeah. and, and that's crazy. Yep. It's unsustainable, and we have to do something. But the politicians have to want to yep. do something. All right, Robert Swift's got dead tro, two of the state's leading reporters. They're in the house and they're next right here, right after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. 
Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the State System of Higher Education. 14 state-owned universities, the state system is the largest provider of higher education in Pennsylvania. And by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back to the program. Well, joining me as often as the case is Robert Swift from Time Shamrock Newspapers and Scott Detrow, Public Radio Capital News, two of the state's leading reporters. All right, Scott, you and Joe the Plumber have this thing going on. Now, hold Apparently. on. Joe, you interviewed Joe, uh, Joe the Plumber at the Republican State Committee meeting. It was not at the official meeting. We then turn around, and he goes on Hannity last week and... and said McCain's gone, he, 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 he doesn't know why he supported him, and doesn't support him now, and, and then he said, you misquoted him. Now, I, I, I don't think that was the case. Yeah, well, first of all, I didn't misquote him. And second of all, uh, it was interesting, Joe didn't really straight out say that I misquoted him, he was hemming and hawing, but Hannity and Hannity's folks really wanted to say that I misquoted him. The yeah. graphic said, you know, taken out of context. The interesting thing was uh, Joe the Plumber, he uh, or Sam Wurzelbacher, uh, gave this speech at the Sam Rohr event, and during it he said he doesn't support John McCain, that John McCain is is a career politician, he's not a public servant. And I asked him about it afterwards, and I said, you know, it's kind of interesting because he put you where you are now. Absolutely. And he said he kind of he said McCain had messed up his life, saying he didn't really like the spotlight, but he's making these speeches now out of duty, you know, feeling that he has this platform he, no, and he it, wants to talk about it. it. He went all he went over the country. He was a big celebrity. He said all these great things about John McCain, and then all of a sudden he repudiates him, says he won't support him. The Sam Rohr event was at the Republican State Committee. We're going to come back. Robert, Robert, what? Look, you covered this stuff for decades. What's this all about? This is the, here's what shows Scott's story. It shows the um, viral effect now of people like Joe the Plumber, other celebrities, when they say something in Harrisburg. In the past, it may have, you know, yeah. a little dust here. Now it goes Everywhere. viral in minutes and in hours, and Fox is picking it up because, yeah. you know, obviously Joe the Plumber is one of their you know, figures they and they have to sort of, you know, want to find out what's but, going on. But that's London okay. But that's, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I saw papers in England had this yeah. quote. It but was no, everywhere. that's okay. But my point about it is, why didn't they put Scott Detrow on? I mean, you should have, no, at least the, well, I mean, I was. We newsmakers to talk about. Yeah, well, that's true. We're doing it. <laughs> All right. Well, you keep us posted. Let me, let me know how that goes. All right. Look, I want to talk a little bit about uh, talking about uh, Joe the Plumber, this Tea Party movement, Robert, you've seen mm -hmm. a lot of these sort of groundswell movements. This is a bigger movement, perhaps, than people think. It's more diverse. It has a tendency to really be a major factor in the politics in our state in these elections, yes or no? Um, it does. I, I think people want to take a close look on March 9th, and that's the filing deadline for a lot of these, you know, state party committee right. posts around the state. And places like Lancaster County, if you see a lot of all of a sudden Tea Party people running for these vacant committee seats in many mm -hmm. areas to gauge your strength. That's the real, can they get people so out? So you think yeah. you, you think one possibility is mm -hmm. they actually try to get within the structure of yes. the party as opposed to kind of look at candidates out from outside and say, well, we'll support you, but we won't support you. Go ahead. Yeah, last weekend uh, at this Roar event, it was a day-long event going on at the same time as the state committee meeting, and it was really interesting because they brought in uh, these various strategists, and one of the sessions was about does the Tea Party movement want to try and fill these vacant state committee seats to make a run at the Republican Party itself, or do they want to uh, yeah. try and branch out and create their own movement? It's an interesting back and forth that, uh, that people in yeah. this you know, in this movement are discussing wow. right now. But look, the, the bigger point from my, from, as an analyst is simply this, look, depending on what they do, they could have a huge effect on the outcome. I mean, look what happened in the congressional race up in New York, mm -hmm. 23rd congressional race seat where they split and a Democrat won. What will they do with uh, someone like Tom Corbett? That, Tom, you know, uh, not, you know, Corbett's been to a couple of their meetings and he's been very deferential, but they've, they've not come on board with him. And Pat Toomey, the Senate, uh, obviously it looks like he will be the senator, Senate candidate of the Republicans. Look what he did. 
he wouldn't endorse Corbett, and then he turned around and wouldn't go to the Tea Party. I'm talking about Pat Toomey. This is is this a good example of that yeah. of that dilemma? Even uh, Pennsylvania has a reputation as a highly partisan state between Republican and Democrats, yep. but even here, the growing uh, strength of the independent vote now maybe 30 percent. And this is a volatile group, and they are you know switching within a year as we're seeing. Uh, if they don't like. You know, they're changing their allegiance. They have no allegiance to, in many cases, to anybody. Yeah. And do so it's you, up for grabs. Do, do you think that, depending on what happens, they could be a huge force in the election this year? I mean, I think so. And I think to a person, when you talk to these folks, they're, they're not Republicans, they're conservatives. Yeah. You know, they're very First. clear to tell you that. And I think that uh, Republican candidates really would do themselves hard to ignore these people. Yeah. I think they're going to have to really go out and court them just as much as they go yeah. and court the independent voters in these elections. Well, I thought they were, I mean, I, you, you all were there and tweeting it and, you know, I'm following what you're doing. I didn't, I didn't attend it, uh, did any coverage of that Republican meeting. But what I, what I saw there was the Republican Party, Scott Detrow, paying great deference to him. That's fair. Um, when Corbett gave his acceptance speech after he got the norm nomination, he had a big segment at the end reaching out to those types of people, saying, if you're dissatisfied with the tax structure, if you yeah. think government spends too much, I'm with you, I agree with you, I want to work with you. All right, we'll be back. We're talking with two of the state's leading reporters, Robert Swift and Scott Detrow, back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by... Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at Highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. Hi, welcome back. All right, I just want to briefly get into the budget, uh, Robert. Let's start with you. Look. Tough time. Go, go. Give us a quick overview of, of where you think this process. Where does this stand? Budget, Are we going to end up at yeah. June 30 again, and we don't. The budget have a... never really ended. It started from like yeah, fall of 2008. Point. It's the, all these line items in the budget. They're not. The lack of permanence is a striking characteristic. The governor now was trying to, um, as a new knack, where he wants to, you know, re rearrange the sales tax and add Marcellus shale tax, but have the uh, collective revenues, but not spend it until after he leaves office to deal with. Future uh, yeah. going off. He's the actually cliff. planning ahead, particularly yes. on the pension business, right? I don't. Most people do not think that the budget's going to be passed on July first wow. or June thirtieth. Wow. I really don't. Now think hold so. on. Now hold on, yeah. Scott. All these house, me every house member, you know, who stands for re-election, one half of the Senate, they're up there, and you know the environment. You've you've mm -hmm. done lots of reporting about this. I mean, imagine this. June thirty, Rendell just says, if you don't give me what I want. I'm, I'm going to make you stay here. Right. <laughs> and every single one of these lawmakers is running against an opponent who first or second on their list of things to talk about is the fact that the state can't get yeah. these budgets passed on time, that the legislature doesn't do anything. So that pl plays right into all of their opponents' campaigns if this is yet another late budget, especially if it creeps into the, uh, the stronger election season. I mean, if we're talking about September without yeah. a budget like we, we did last year, that's really a bad environment to run for re-election in. Yeah, and, and obviously, when we particularly talk about the governor's race, this has got to be a huge factor even in the governor's contest where, you know, we'll see if, uh, as we tape this program, it's possible that Chris Doherty, I know you have a, the Scranton Times is up there in your other newspapers, he could get out. We've got Anthony Williams of Philadelphia, a state senator from Philly. So it, on the Democratic side, that mix, I mean, is, is getting complicated. Aren't these candidates going to have to deal with this budget and the budget process? Uh, you know, Tom Corbett tried a little bit with this idea for the special session, which is sort of a, yeah. something other. I remember Lieutenant Governor Scranton tried that in 86. But when I say, um, I, I think the, uh, I don't think the budget will go into October or September. Mm -hmm. That's too dangerous for, for the incumbent yeah. lawmakers. But I certainly think it's going to go on uh, beyond the deadline because, once again, there's going to be a lot of these issues attached to it right. that are hard to, hard to right. solve, and it's going to take time. Yeah, now my theory about this is, that the legislature has through the 4th, July 4th. You know why? Because people are at the mountains and they're at the shore. But after July 4th, you all are going to come back and be writing stories about here we go, day 4, day 5, day mm -hmm. 6 with, with, with no budget. But the real question is, there's, can the governor has said a, mil, a billion dollars in new spending, a 4.1% hike in overall in increase in the budget. I mean, 
that ha looks like a non-starter, particularly in the state Senate. Am I wrong about that? Right. It was, it was really striking to hear the arguments coming out of Republicans and Democrats right after Governor Rendell's budget address a few weeks ago. It was exactly where mm -hmm. we were last year. It's, you know, the governor says this is a modest increase, but the Republicans say this is a non-starter. Uh, the quote from Scarnati about the, uh, the sales, sales tax was right. this is dead on arrival in the Senate. So it seems we're already very firmly trenched into these two arguments, and it's mm -hmm. hard to find a compromise when one side wants to, to cut government spending and the other side is floating yep. these various yep. revenue increases. All right, this is, as you can tell, this is a little lightning round here. We're going through three or four topics to g give you an update. All right, I want to go to one last topic, the Vion trial. It goes on as we speak. It looks like it's going to go on and on and on. Uh, everyone says that this is very important to Tom Corbett, the attorney general who's prosecuting him, loses the Vion case. Mm. Uh, maybe not defining that means defeats him in the governor's election, but boy, Robert, you've covered a lot of these trials. This is pretty, he, he, he has to win this politically, doesn't he? Um, he has to, I mean, has, I mean, I think it's not going to affect whether he wins the nomination or not of the Republican Party. Yeah, but how about um, the election? The election, it, it's going to depend on who the Democratic nominee is. Yeah. Uh, he, he, once again, he has these guilty pleas. Yeah, and you think uh, he's going to yeah. The question is how, if the Vion trial ends in acquittal, really what happens to the other charges against the former speakers, yeah. Bill DeWeese and John Perzel? But, but, I mean, the air, does the air go out of him if he loses? I mean, I, mean, know, I think that's a tough a, thing. To... Right, that's a real question. And um, I, I was in court for the first week of the trial. I've been following it through Twitter and through newspaper stories since then. I think it's fair to say the defense has done a really good job at poking holes of the credibility. Mm -hmm of these witnesses who put together plea deals with the right. government are cooperating. They're saying, well, you're sitting here telling us about what Vion and others did, but why should we believe you? You broke the law, yeah. and you're striking a deal to try and stay out of jail. Yeah, I mean, I guess my, my feeling about this is that it's not about the underlings so much as it is about the, about the people who orchestrated it, you know, the people who planned it and designed it. Now, maybe the top folks like the chiefs of staff and others were planning that, but I... I I, I, this is, it all could have some potential, you know, ab about the, the, the future in terms of whether Attorney General will even go after people, right? that, Yeah, Corbett set a new course in terms of state uh, yeah. prosecutions. He created an office to do this. Yeah. In the past, it was the feds who have been doing this. All right, you get the final word. All right, as always, thanks for watching Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and you stay well.